Hello everyone, welcome back. We are in the last module and in this module we are going to discuss different topics. The first one is uh, first order reliability analysis that we will revisit and discuss some of the uh, major aspects of first order reliability method that we, we have already gone through. Uh, its development and uh, how we can use this method for uh, different problems that we have uh, discussed in detail. So, uh, in this uh, uh, we will revisit that first order reliability method and we will see how over the years it has uh, uh, come to its current format and what are the developments. So, in this uh, uh, lecture today we are going to first review the first order reliability method then its development in the last 40 plus years then uh, out of all those possibilities uh, we will take one example just to see how different uh, uh, researchers they uh, came up with different ideas and improved this technique so what are the main features of this and how that was addressed for that we will take up an example so, we will uh, go through one paper and see how they proposed an improvement and uh, how it how much it was effective. So, for the first order reliability method is concerned. And then finally, once we identify the reliability at the component level, obviously for a structure, we need to then uh, add it up in some sequence and then uh, all those components uh, when sequentially fail that actually leads to ultimate failure of the structure. So, that global reliability uh, can be evaluated from the component level reliabilities that we uh, estimate using first order reliability method. So, in the last segment of this lecture, we will talk about failure modes and in these failure modes, how uh, the failure of different components affect the global sensitivity, global failure of the structure uh, where there may be series or parallel systems and how to solve those problems that we are going to discuss in the last segment of this uh, lecture. So, to start with, uh, let us revisit Hassofer leaned reliability index and we have already gone through this model, uh, which I am not going to uh, go through again. But uh, the key feature of this uh, Hassofer leaned definition, let us go through quickly. So, we start with the limit state function in the original space that is gx equal to 0 and that we convert into the standard normal space where gz equal to 0. Now, in the standard normal space, if we have a nonlinear limit state function that we linearize. So, this blue line represents that linearized function and then using gradient based algorithm, we try to find out the most probable point of failure. Now, this point represents the nearest distance from the origin in the standard normal space and which we identify as the reliability index beta. Now, to do so, because we adopt a gradient based algorithm uh, when we identify this optimal point. So, we first need to differentiate this limit state function with respect to the standard normal variable. So, that is the first requirement for the uh, first order reliability method uh, if we follow this Hassofer lin definition. So, the limit state must be differentiable at least once. Then, Using that information, we can identify what we call direction cosines. So, you can see here this alpha i is the expression for direction cosines. Now, if you start with any arbitrary point using this direction cosine, we can evaluate the next uh, optimal point and that is how we gradually come to this most probable point of failure. So, the two major uh, factors that affect uh, the performance of this uh, model is the uh, nature of the limit state, it must be differentiable and the direction cosines that actually guides the uh, points on the limit state ultimately identifying the most probable point of failure. Now, obviously, in this optimization process, we have uh, random variables and random variables can have different options and all these four options we have already gone through and how to uh, deal with those cases and solve for uh, reliability index and subsequently probability of failure that uh, uh, are uh, clear to us we can easily adopt different models. But the main feature of this is again uh, the differentiability of the limit state and the sensitivity 
that is governed by this uh, parameter direction cosine that is alpha i. Now, uh, if we see the development of this uh, reliability uh, based design, so it actually started uh, in 1947 when this paper actually came and it talked about safety of structures. Um, earlier, uh, all uh, designs were based on some factor of safety, a magic number that uh, uh, we still use in many cases and uh, we assume that if the factor of safety is more than 1, then obviously uh, we will always have a uh, safe uh, design. But because of the uncertainty, uh, even uh, in cases where we have factor of safety more than 1, uh, we can still uh, experience failure. So, to solve that, uh, Cornell came up with his definition in 1969. So, he proposed first the reliability index instead of uh, factor of safety. Now, this reliability index is the ratio of the mean and standard deviation of the limit state function g. Now, this is also a non-dimensional number just like the factor of safety we have and this non-dimensional number is also correlated with the probability of failure, Pf is nothing but phi of minus beta. But this model uh, proposed by Cornell, uh, it is very handy, but it has a lot of limitations. And one of the main uh, limitation is the lack of invariance, which means uh, for the same problem, if we change the format of the limit state and for two different cases, if we find out the mean and standard deviation using variance algebra and then use this uh, model to identify the probability of failure which comes from this reliability index, obviously for two different format of limit state we get two different estimates of the reliability index and subsequently probability of failure which is nothing but the uh, lack of invariance of this model and that was addressed by Hassofer and Lind in 1974. So, they came up with the idea of optimal distance in the standard normal space and which uh, we have already seen in the previous slide. So, here the main uh, factor is this uh, direction cosines that actually helps us to identify the optimal distance through iteration. Now, in 1981 came actually this uh, book which actually talked about the applications of uh, uncertainty based modeling in civil engineering. Uh, designs. So, after this, a uh, lot of issues came. Uh, for example, uh, the limit state function has random variables which are non-normal. And for that, uh, one paper came in 1981 which talked about actually non-normal uh, random variables and how we can incorporate those in the structural reliability model, which we have already gone through. But that is how uh, gradually it started from the identification of the mm, safety of the structures and what are the parameters that affect the safety of the structures then finally to the non-normal random variables and how to incorporate them in the um, hassofer lind uh, reliability index. Obviously, in this iterative procedure, uh, convergence is not always guaranteed. So, uh, from the beginning, uh, this uh, was a major issue whenever we uh, tried to apply uh, structural reliability using this uh, hassofer lin definition. Now, different people worked uh, on this issue and uh, we will also see some of them. So, uh, one of the uh, important paper came in 1988 and it actually talked about the sensitivity and how that affects the um, choice of random variable that we uh, have in the limit state definition. Now, obviously, when we start a design, we identify different variables and if we consider all of them to be random variable, obviously, uh, they do not uh, affect the overall uh, this non-dimensional number reliability index in the similar way and if we have large number of random variables, obviously, the computation of reliability index becomes difficult. That is the reason uh, we need to keep the number of random variables as minimum as possible so that uh, we can uh, effectively and efficiently identify 
the reliability index and evaluate probability of failure. So, if we consider a limit state, as you can see here, g of z1 and z2, so we have two random variables in this case and if you look at the expression on the right hand side, this is uh, a linear limit state function. Now, in this case, if we find out beta because the limit state is linear, we can uh, easily use this Quarnell's definition in this case and we can identify mu g and sigma g. So, for mu g, we just uh, replace this two random variables z1 and z2 uh, with its mean value and then uh, we also find out uh, the standard deviation and that is how we evaluate uh, reliability index. Then uh, for this uh, limit state definition, we can easily identify the direction cosines that is alpha i. Now, in this case, the expression is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. We can differentiate this limit state function with respect to z1 and z2 and uh, um, uh, that will give us the expression of direction cosine. Now, if we replace uh, this uh, z1 by mu1 uh, in this limit state definition and we evaluate the beta, then in this paper, the sensitivity factor was defined as gamma 1 of mu1 which is the ratio of beta when z1 was replaced by mu1 divided by the beta when we consider two different random variables. And if we simplify this expression, we get this uh, in terms of direction cosine. Now, uh, these parameters actually uh, help to identify the important uh, uh, random variables uh, within the definition of the limit state function. Now, still the convergence uh, was a major issue and different uh, researchers actually tried to solve this problem and one of the important paper came in 1992. It was by Liu and uh, Derkarian. So, it actually talked about optimization algorithms uh, so that we have uh, guaranteed convergence. Now, if you recall, mm, uh, this Hassofer lean reliability index because it uses a gradient based algorithm and that depends on the nature of the uh, limit state function, uh, convergence is not always guaranteed. And uh, the expression for uh, this uh, design point in the kth iteration uh, is uh, you can see on your screen. So, it start with this uh, zk in the kth iteration and at the end of this iteration, it actually identifies the new design point that is zk plus 1. Now, in this uh, model, we have already uh, discussed this model. It is actually uh, from uh, a root finding algorithm using uh, newton raphson technique. Now, in this paper, uh, Linear search direction was identified and if you can see this decay in the kth iteration, so it is effectively the difference between z k plus 1 and the z k, uh, so the two design points. So that is uh, how the uh, search direction was identified and along with that search direction, a merit function was also proposed and the expression for merit function is this, uh, the detailed discussion you can also go through uh, this paper. Uh, we just wish to see how this uh, first order reliability method developed over the time. So, we are not going to, uh, I mean, the details of this derivation. But this merit function along with the direction dk was proposed so that uh, we get the right direction to uh, guide the iterative algorithm for um, uh, this uh, optimal solution for the new design point. So, uh, here this mz, the main issue is, is this mz function, which is a merit function proposed in this, it can have minima apart from MPP. So, that was the one of the major problem and not only that, uh, this dk uh, may not always have uh, the appropriate direction where we have MPP. So, but uh, in many problems, actually, this uh, linear search direction along with the merit function uh, that works and uh, it gives a uh, satisfactory answer. Uh, it improves the robustness, uh, which is otherwise not always guaranteed in the Hassofer-Lind reliability problem. 
Now, uh, they further improved this proposal uh, and, and uh, they improved this uh, definition of the uh, merit function. And not only that, uh, they also came up with the bounds of this uh, merit function and where uh, this is applicable. So, they came up with this uh, uh, conditions so that uh, we get a guaranteed convergence. So, in this way, they developed the merit function, they improved the, the quality of the merit function and that is how uh, they improved the uh, robustness of this algorithm based on Hasselhoff lean index. So, after this paper in 1992 came another paper by the uh, authors in 1997. So, uh, it actually talked about, uh, it is a report, it actually talks about uh, how we can effectively use this merit function along with the linear search uh, direction so that uh, we can improve the convergence of the original Hasselhoff lean reliability index. Then there are uh, these three papers I will highlight and I will uh, suggest all of you to go through. Uh, these are actually uh, the reviews of uh, the development of uh, reliability index and how it was proposed uh, and improved in a first order reliability framework. So, these three papers particularly in 1989, then 2001 and then finally in 2015, it talked about uh, the development of this complete method. So, uh, I will suggest all of you to go through uh, because uh, it has a lot of other uh, informations that are essential when you use first order reliability method for complex structures. So, with that background, if we progress, so we will use one paper. Uh, that came in 2007, it actually proposes a different way to solve the first order reliability problem and we will quickly go through this paper and see how uh, the authors proposed an alternate method to solve the uh, first order reliability problem. So, in this uh, model, uh, what we do, we actually convert the uh, random variables that is x to z and also uh, we need to have inverse transformation from z to x. Uh, this is very common in other uh, format of uh, first order or second order reliability problem because ultimately the definition of the reliability index is actually uh, given in the standard normal space. So, if you start with the original space that we first need to convert and there are different other isoprobabilistic transformation uh, which we have gone through that also effectively converts this x to z and then finally uh, z to x. Now, uh, in this uh, paper, uh, the authors propose actually a third order polynomial equation to replace the uh, original random variable x. So, in their proposal, uh, it is actually if the random variable say x, then uh, this is the expression for the polynomial uh, and uh, it has constants. So, a1, a2, a3, a4, these are the constants and this z, you can see this is the standard normal variable. So, our task in this model is to find out a1, a2, a3 and a4 it is uh, similar uh, to what we have already discussed in the response surface method. Although there, instead of x, we actually replace the response surface using some polynomial expression. So, in this case, uh, the random variable is itself is actually replaced by uh, this functional form. And in this format, obviously, the unknowns are a1, a2, a3, a4. So, the main task is to find out these constants and because we have four constants for that uh, again we use first four moments and if we equate first four moments that gives us uh, multiple equations to solve this uh, constant in this model. Now, once we identify then uh, we need to express the limit state function using this new definition of the random variable. Now, obviously, uh, the 
determination of this constants a1 a2 a3 a4 it's not straightforward and uh, there are uh, different ways we can do it and in this paper uh, they used fisherman's expression uh, and and using that actually uh, it was identified so in this expression uh, this excess can be expressed in this format and the constant in this case is you can see this h3 and h4 and the expression for this h3 and h4 are given obviously this alpha 3 and alpha 4 these uh, correspond to um, skewness and the kurtosis of the original random variable then uh, once we do that obviously uh, uh, if we start with say xi and then uh, the CDF of XI is defined by this uh, uh, capital FX of X. Then uh, using this uh, uh, model uh, proposed by Fisher and Cornish, uh, this uh, expansion with respect to N, we can uh, replace this X with this uh, expression. And then obviously here the expression for W is given. So this uh, constant in this uh, expression on the right hand side h1 h2 and h11 it comes from the harmite polynomial so the expressions for h1 h2 and h11 is given here uh, which is obtained from the uh, definition of the harmite polynomial which is an orthogonal polynomial so now substituting these values we can then replace x with this new format and obviously if we substitute mu equal to 0 and sigma equal to 1 because we are ultimately reaching towards uh, standard normal space and then we have effectively this is the expression for x. So once we have that then uh, we can further simplify neglecting higher order terms uh, that this is the final expression for xs uh, where this random variable is replaced by the uh, standard normal random variable. Uh, and there are other modifications also because uh, sometimes uh, this uh, uh, the definition of uh, uh, kurtosis is altered and then this is further modified uh, effectively yeah, it's the same idea so you have the random variable that we replace uh, with a polynomial function of z and uh, for that again different other uh, proposals are there so for example uh, if we use this Winterstein's proposal, then uh, effectively xx, that is the random variable, will come in this format and the unknown um, constants uh, are given here. And obviously, there are some uh, uh, inequality constants also uh, for the validity of this expression. So, uh, as we see, we will, uh, as we progress, we will see how this uh, uh, can be used to effectively model and what are the uh, limitations uh, in this and how uh, using this expression the first order relativity problem uh, was solved. So, uh, effectively what we use, we use fourth moment for this uh, um, replacing the original random variable with a polynomial function. Now, again, um, the same approach uh, you see the nature of the polynomial function on the right hand side and uh, our main task is again is to find out uh, the unknown constant and in this uh, case the unknown constants are L1, L2 and K1, K2. And in this paper these uh, uh, expressions are uh, derived so you can go through that. However, uh, once we start with the definition of the limit state and we identify the random variables you can see on the right hand side we can estimate this skewness and kurtosis and with the help of that we can actually identify uh, these constant and again uh, there is a range over which this uh, expressions are valid and using this expression we can convert x into z or z into x now uh, Again, uh, in this paper, there are other derivations given to finally express the random variable uh, using the polynomial function of z. And they also identified uh, uh, the inequality and the range over which uh, their expressions can be applied. 
and compared with other results. So, this uh, uh, definition you can uh, also go through from their paper. So, these are the uh, skewness and kurtosis in terms of the new definition of the limit state function in terms of uh, standard normal variable. Now, once you use this, for example, if you start with a Gumbel distribution, uh, the PDF of the Gumbel distribution is here. And then uh, for different values of alpha and beta, that is the parameter of the Gumbel distribution and uh, mean value and standard deviation also uh, skewness and kurtosis. Uh, if you use uh, this uh, proposal uh, and then uh, this shows how best it can fit the distribution and it can convert this x to z or z to x using different options. So, out of that, if you see this fourth moment, it has a uh, range over which it can be applied to replace the uh, original functions and uh, using this fourth moment based transformation then we can uh, replace x uh, by z with z or we can transform z to x. Similarly, if we take log normal distribution and these are the parameters of the log normal distributions along with mean standard deviation and uh, uh, skewness and kurtosis. Then again uh, for that also you can see how effectively this fourth moment based method uh, actually uh, replace um, the other um, models and we can use this say these green dots to convert x s to z and vice versa. So, the algorithm of this method goes like this. Uh, we start with the definition of the limit state where we identify the random variables and that we replace with this uh, new uh, polynomial scheme. Then once we identify that main task is to find out L1, L2, K1, K2 that is the constant in this uh, expression. And for that we need uh, skewness and kurtosis and then uh, we need to satisfy the conditions. Once we do that, uh, we identify all these constants and then once we do that, uh, we convert uh, gx into gz with the help of this new definition of the random variable and then finally, uh, we can adopt reliability analysis on top of that uh, uh, definition of the limit state in the z space. So, let us uh, solve an example. So, in this case, uh, again, it is a portal frame uh, with uh, two loads acting and uh, that can cause plastic failure. So, the gx in these case is given here and uh, the mean, mean values and standard deviation in this case covariance is given. So, that is the complete definition of the limit state and it is uh, a random variable. So, uh, Conventionally, what we can do because we have uh, this covariance matrix, then we can convert this into y space and in the y space, we can identify uh, the properties of the new random variable y1, y2, y3, y4 and y5 in this case. So, uh, using that transformation, we can convert uh, the original problem into z space and solve it. But that is the expression if you follow this uh, route which we have already discussed. But in this method, uh, this is the uh, new definition of the gz uh, because each and every random variable is converted into z space using their proposal and then ultimately the limit state function is expressed. So, then uh, on top of this if you solve uh, using different options, we have the result here. So, using MCS, uh, the beta is 2.8597 and corresponding PF is here. So, uh, the original expression can be solved using form. The result is here using NetApp transformation also you can see and then finally, the fourth moment based approach proposed by these authors. So, it clearly gives an idea how the same problem is solved by uh, some other approach and where um, the random variable is actually replaced by a polynomial function and then using that uh, definition the first order reliability problem is solved. This is the second example a doubly reinforced beam that we have solved many times. So, this is the definition of the uh, beam and then for that uh, this is the limit state function. Here also again uh, 
we will find out beta and pf and for that again we adopt the same approach and in this case i'm not going to the details uh, of this uh, estimate step by step effectively what is important is the uh, estimation of beta and pf obviously we uh, we adopt a, a small number of mcs problem in this case that's the reason there is a difference otherwise uh, the estimate between form and and fourth moment they they match very closely so the beta and pf is very close and that clearly shows how this method uh, effectively estimates uh, the reliability index so uh, but some uh, point to be noted here uh, in this case again if we have a uh, uh, case where skewness is 0 and uh, kurtosis is 3 then if you try to estimate uh, this uh, constant l1 will become 0 l2 will also become 0 then k1 is 1 and k2 uh, is uh, 0 now using these if you try to estimate the other uh, parameters then obviously the z will become infinity because this k2 is 0 in this expression so that's a kind of limitation of this nevertheless for problems uh, where uh, you don't have this situation skewness is not 0 and kurtosis is not uh, 3 then in that case uh, this method actually gives a uh, very nice transformation and that you can use to evaluate the reliability index and subsequently probability of failure so this is one of the way uh, how uh, some researchers proposed the same problem and then uh, solve the problem for some cases it is very effective and obviously there are some limitations so it clearly gives uh, an idea how this first order reliability method has developed over time so as we progress as i have said that uh, once we have a complete structure and then first order reliability method gives uh, reliability index when we identify a limit state function for a particular uh, structural component for example if we have a portal frame uh, ultimate failure can be governed by the failure of different structural components so what we have learned by now is the uh, reliability index and probability of failure how to estimate these two parameters for a uh, element and for that we identify the limit state function random variables and then using different models for first order reliability method uh, we can identify the optimal distance in the standard normal space but in case of actual structure as you can see here uh, obviously it will have uh, different components the question automatically comes in our mind how we can integrate this component level reliability index and identify the global uh, probability of failure now for that what we need to do is to combine this information at the element level and then subsequently from this element we need to actually go to the global level and then estimate the probability of failure now for this different uh, structural components at the element level uh, we uh, govern the failure modes so there can be different options these components may be either in series or in parallel or there can be a mixed system so as we progress we will see now again uh, why we uh, go for this kind of uh, failure mode analysis the main objective is to convert the element level uh, estimation of reliability index to the global level so for that uh, at the element level we can adopt different models and then once we have that element level information then gradually uh, we identify different failure modes and then through that we estimate the global probability of failure for example if you have a complex structure like this one it can fail in different modes and then for every possible failure modes we first need to identify the probability of failure and then out of all those possibilities 
uh, we need to uh, identify which path most likely it will uh, follow. So the system can be in series, can be in parallel or it can be a com combination of these uh, two options. So let us start with the first option where we have a series system. So in this case, it is like a chain. So if you have a chain, it is made of different links. Now, if one of the link, it, if it fails, obviously the complete chain breaks and that's how the series system behaves. So, this system where all the components are in series, obviously uh, it will perform satisfactorily when all the components in this system perform satisfactorily and for that, Again, the weakest link we need to identify and that governs the overall uh, safety and reliability. So this is the schematic diagram of a series system where we have different components and they are obviously in series and in this case, uh, if one of the system breaks, that complete system uh, fails. So the question is, we have different uh, events marked by this AI that represents different uh, components uh, which forms this uh, chain like uh, sequence in this series system. Now let us define probability of SS. We have two S here. Uh, the first S actually represents the survival and the second S represents the system. So. PSS represents the probability of survival of the complete system. Similarly, PFS, the first subscript that is F represents failure and the second subscript that is S which represents the system. So, PFS is the probability of failure of the complete system. Obviously, PSS will be 1 minus PFS because um, summation of these two will always be uh, 1. Now for a series system, um, all its component must satisfactorily perform so that the global uh, reliability is ensured. So for that, uh, if the system fails, if any one of the link fails, obviously the overall system fails. So PSS in this case will be probability of A1 intersection A2. Uh, this will be 2, A2 intersection up to AN. So, all these are different components. So, their probability we can identify probability of failure using first order reliability method or similar reliability methods at the component level. And then using that information, we can identify this PSS. The question is how we can estimate this. Obviously, if we assume that all these uh, events AI, they are independent, then we can uh, write down PSS as the product of probability of A1, uh, A2 uh, up to AN. So we can write that in a very compact form. So for every uh, event, so if we have say the event AI, uh, PFI is the probability of failure. So, 1 minus that is the probability of survival and uh, that represents the ith event and because AI is, uh, it is an independent event, obviously we get the overall product to identify what is PSS. Now, in this case, again, PFI is the probability of failure of the ith component. And uh, total number of components in this series system is n. Now, if we have a case where this PFI is very small, normally uh, we design a component uh, where probability of failure is very small, then uh, in that case we can further modify this expression and uh, this PSS will be nothing but 1 minus uh, summation of all PFIs. That we can easily prove if you just take say i equal to 1 to 2 and then take the product of uh, 1 minus p of 1 and 1 minus p of 2, you can easily prove this uh, expression. So once we identify p 
PSS, we can also identify PFS, which is nothing but 1 minus of this quantity. So, obviously, it will be summation of all PFIs. So, if we take an example, uh, in this case, again, we have uh, a series system where there are 4 subsystems and for each of them, probability of failure is identified. The question is, what will be the combined probability of failure when these components are in series. So, we can identify PSS uh, from this expression. It is the product of 1 minus PFI. So, for each case, we know uh, PFI. So, 1 minus of that and then we take the product. So, ultimately what we get PSS is uh, 0 0.3024. So, that is the uh, probability of survival that is the reliability of the system. So, 1 minus of that is the probability of failure. Now, if we have a parallel system, then uh, the problem is a uh, little different. So, in this case, if uh, one of the component works satisfactorily, that ensures the survival of the complete system. For example, if we have this case and if one column fails, that does not ensure the failure of the complete system. So, if at least one of them works satisfactorily, then uh, still the system can work. So, the schematic diagram of this parallel system is like this. So, we have uh, n number of subsystems uh, which are in uh, parallel. Obviously, in this case, uh, if uh, at least one of the subsystem works, then uh, that can ensure the uh, survival of the global system. So, again in this case, PSS is 1 minus PFS, uh, that definition of PSS and PFS remain same. But in this case, uh, the PFS uh, is nothing but the probability of AI complement intersection uh, of A2 complement and uh, it goes up to the uh, nth uh, subcomponent. You can easily prove this, uh, take it as an exercise. So, PFS is uh, given by this expression. So, 1 minus of that is nothing but PSS. Now, AIC, it is uh, the event uh, corresponding to ith component, but in this case, uh, we take the complement function uh, of the event AI. So, Again, uh, all these AI complement, they are independent. Obviously, in that case, uh, we can express this PSS in this uh, form where this PFS can be identified by this product expression of all the events uh, we have in this case. So, uh, effectively, PSS is 1 minus product of all PFIs. So, let us take an example. If you have the same... Um, PFIs, so we have altogether four uh, subcomponents and they are in uh, parallel. So, if we try to find out uh, what is the overall uh, reliability, that we can easily do it. Uh, PSS is nothing but 1 minus product of all this failure probability. So, effectively, it is 0 0.9937. And once we uh, identify that, we can also identify what is the uh, PFS, that is 1 minus of this quantity is the uh, probability of failure at the global level. So, that is uh, about parallel system, but in reality, we have a mixed system. So, for example, in this case, you can see we have altogether four uh, components out of that one and two are in series and then three and four are in, in parallel. And uh, this is a definition of a mixed system where we have uh, combinations of series and parallel system. So, for this type of system, the first task is to identify uh, the subgroups. For example, in this case, 1 and 2 are in series. So, we can uh, identify the system, say, S1, where we have this series system, and then we can also identify another component of the overall uh, network where 3 and 4 are in parallel. So, for that say this S2 which are in parallel. So, then 
uh, we can replace the uh, mix system using this new system where we have S1 and S2 and they are in series. So effectively this S1 represents this uh, dotted block where 1 and 2 are in uh, series. Similarly, S2 represents uh, this uh, dotted block where uh, 3 and 4 are in parallel. Now, once we identify that, then we can use previous uh, expressions to uh, find out the global reliability. So, first task is to find out uh, the probability of uh, failure or survival, whichever way we define for S1 and S2 and then we will combine them to find out the global um, PSS. So, for that again uh, we identify this E1 that is the event for this uh, subsystem one works satisfactorily. So, similarly E2 and then uh, if the events are ident independent then we can identify PSS using this expression. And then from that we can find out PFSI that is the probability of failure of the subsystem uh, defined by I. So for the mix system again uh, using this information we can identify probability of SS. So if we take the uh, same values of probability of failure of the subcomponent so we have altogether four subcomponents and the PFIs are given here. Out of that one and two are in series and three and four are in parallel. So for the series system, we first find out PSS1, uh, which is 0 0.63. And then for S2, then we identify uh, PSS2, which is 0.94. Then uh, we can combine them to find out the overall uh, reliability of the global system. Now, let us consider a different example. So, in this example, we have a rigid frame. This frame, uh, it has a point load at the center and because of this point load, uh, plastic hinges may develop and there can be uh, different combinations of the plastic hinge that can actually lead to the global failure. For example, one combination is shown here. So, these are the critical sections marked by this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So, at these critical sections, hinges can form. So, among all those possibilities, one formation is shown here, which will lead to collapse. Similarly, there is another configuration here and there may be other configurations too. The question is, if we can identify uh, these failure modes and then how can we uh, use this information and find out the uh, global uh, safety of this uh, portal frame. So, for that again uh, the properties of the random variables are given here. So, we have altogether uh, seven critical sections where hinges can develop and for that we have m1 to m7 and they are in kilonewton meter and their mean and standard deviation you can see on your screen. And then we have a uh, point load at the center. So, this is the critical location 4 and the value of w in kilonewton. Uh, so, the mean and standard deviation for w is also given. So, here mi is the plastic moment capacity of the ith section and all uh, random variables are normally distributed and independent. So, our task is to find out the system reliability. Now, the frame can fail uh, because uh, the formation of hinges uh, in different mode which are identified here. Now, we can develop the condition which will ensure failure using virtual work principle. So, that is what you can see on your screen. And then uh, in this uh, model, theta is the virtual rotation. Uh, for example, if it is it fails in this mode, uh, theta is the rotation here. And uh, 
the safety margin obviously in this case will be given by this expression so that's the limit state for this problem so now probability of survival ps is nothing but uh, where probability of g greater than equal to 0 now for that again uh, we need to evaluate the parameters of g and because we have a linear limit state again we can uh, use this expression to find out mu g and uh, that's the value of mu g from the individual mean of m2 m4 m6 and uh, w then we can also find out sigma g and this expression comes from the variance algebra so we can estimate sigma g in these cases uh, 312.755 kN. And then uh, all the variables are independent. Obviously, uh, we have identified mu g and sigma g and then we can identify uh, probability of frame uh, under mode 1. So, if this is the mode, we can evaluate pf uh, corresponding to g less than 0. So, that will be nothing but phi of minus beta and beta is the ratio of mu g and sigma g. So, that we can uh, solve and identify the probability of failure corresponding to mode 1. So, that is the probability of failure corresponding to mode 1. Similarly, we can identify all other modes and corresponding uh, probability of failure and beta we can identify. Now, once we do that, uh, then we can combine this information to find out uh, PSS using this expression and then ultimately we get uh, PSS probability of survival is 0 0.9960 and we can also find out uh, PFS that is the global probability of failure which is nothing but 1 minus PSS. So, in this case it is 4 into 10 to the power minus 3. So, this example gives you a uh, complete idea how uh, we can uh, identify different failure modes and for each mode we can uh, use uh, reliability index to identify probability of failure and for each mode we identify probability of failure and then finally we combine them identifying whether they are in series or in parallel. So, accordingly uh, we choose model but most likely in practical case uh, the components are in uh, mix system. So, in that case again we need to first identify the subcomponents whether they are in uh, series or parallel then we replace those subcomponents using uh, an equivalent system and then finally we solve uh, according to the problem and that is how we actually solve the mix system. Now, uh, obviously the next topic is uh, the bounds on system reliability. Now, in the previous models, we identified uh, all those events AI, they are uh, statistically independent. But uh, in reality, they may not be the uh, case, they may not be statistically independent. For example, uh, if you uh, see the previous case where we had the expressions for GI and uh, these random variables. Uh, that is the plastic moment capacity and W, they appear in different uh, GIs. Obviously, uh, all these GIs cannot be statistically independent. The question is, uh, under this expression, uh, for example, you have a GI, a G1 and G2, their basic random variables are same as in this case, it is the uh, plastic moment capacity of the section and the externally applied load. So, we can uh, evaluate the covariance between G1 and G2 and then uh, we can also find out the correlation coefficient. So, the question is uh, once we have a system where we have different uh, limit state uh, for different failure modes and which are not uh, statistically independent. So, in that case, how to estimate the global reliability? So, 
This correlation coefficient we can also evaluate from the direction cosines that we get from the level 2 reliability analysis and the expression is here. Uh, so we can adapt that. Now, obviously the probability of survival again in these cases when uh, probability of GI is greater than 0. Now, to estimate that effectively we need to estimate this multi-dimensional uh, integral but uh, I mean actually this is very difficult to uh, implement for a, a actual problem and that's the reason different uh, researcher proposed um, bounds for this system reliability instead of solving this multi-dimensional integral. Now the first one is actually the simple bounds it was proposed by Cornell. So, it is applicable for a structure with n failure modes and m load combinations. So, if that is the case, then obviously PSS, uh, it will be 1 minus maximum of this quantity. So, effectively 1 minus max of all PFI. So, this is uh, the upper bound. And then in this format again lower bound was also defined so pss is nothing but the product of 1 minus pfi so effectively the bounds for this pss uh, the lower and upper bounds are identified so that's how uh, the limits are defined obviously if we have uh, a correlated case uh, the overall system uh, reliability will be somewhere in between these two bounds Otherwise, if we need to evaluate the overall global uh, system reliability, obviously we have to first identify the multidimensional integral and then we have to solve that multidimensional integral. But instead of that, once we get these bounds, then we can still use this information to have a satisfactory design at the global level. Now, this is a simple bound. It was proposed by Cornell in 67. Then, uh, if the PFIs, they are very small, obviously further we can simplify this expression and then in that case, we can modify these bounds and the uh, effective uh, upper and lower bounds for this uh, probability of survival, you can uh, express in this format. The only difference between the previous one and the next one is that uh, this product form is replaced by 1 minus this summation form of the probability of failure at the component level. Now, obviously, uh, the probability of failure of the system is given by, governed by this expression. Uh, this, it comes from uh, the previous expression, which is the probability of survival. Obviously, the probability of failure is 1 minus these limits and effectively we get uh, this expression. Now, if there are m load combinations, then uh, this again uh, we need to modify to consider all these load combinations and effectively we get this final expression for the upper and lower bounds of the global reliability. And once we identify the limits for the upper and lower bounds uh, for the reliability, we can also find out the same for the probability of failure. So, this is a simple bound which was introduced by Cornell. Now, there are other bounds. For example, this narrow bound was uh, proposed by Dittlibsen in 1979. So, in this case, again, this is the expression uh, for this uh, PFS and it should be greater than uh, this expression on the right hand side. So, that is the lower bound and then uh, upper bound is also identified. So, now once we combine these, uh, these limits and then uh, we can estimate the upper and lower bounds corresponding to this PFS for this uh, narrow bounds. Now, if we have a case where uh, EI corresponding to ith event is GI less than 0 and EJ is gz less than 0, then we can uh, actually further simplify these bounds 
and what you can see on your screen. So that's effectively the upper and lower bound. But um, for this expression, again, we need to evaluate this joint probability. Uh, that is the probability of EI intersection of EJ. And uh, and this can be evaluated if there are two events A and B. Obviously, it is the summation of the individual uh, probability corresponding to this event A and B. So, we can estimate EJ intersection, uh, sorry, EI intersection EJ using this expression. So, that gives the lower bound. Similarly, upper bound also we can estimate using the probability of the two events A and B. So, maximum of these two will give the upper bound. So, using this expression, we can uh, identify upper and lower bounds. So, that is the case. Now, in case of uh, probability of A, so this is the expression uh, proposed by Adit Lipson and then uh, for B, it is the expression. And then finally, uh, this beta i and beta j uh, comes from the Cornell's reliability index definition. So, let us consider an example. So, if you have a portal frame that we considered earlier and then uh, if we try to find out simple bounds, then uh, we have already identified the probability of failure of uh, different failure modes and then if we combine them, we get this upper bound. Obviously, in this case, it is 4 into 10 to the power minus 3 is the upper bound and similarly, we can also find out lower bound and uh, the lower bound in this case maximum of all PFIs as per simple bounds and in that case it is 2.98 into 10 to the power minus 3. So, what we effectively get is the range of probability of failure at the global level. That gives the simple bounds for the portal frame. Now, if we repeat that exercise for the narrow bounds, the uh, then again we start with the probability of failure at the component level. But in this case, we uh, need to identify uh, two different modes and at a time we uh, use two different modes and for that uh, we find out the bounds and then finally we will combine. So, in this case again covariance between say G1 and G2 that we can easily evaluate um, and then uh, we can find out uh, the correlation coefficient. So, between G1 and G2. Um, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.924. Similarly, between G1 and G3 is also uh, 0 0.924. Similarly, for between all other, uh, uh, I mean, modes, we can identify the correlation coefficient as you can see on your screen. Then uh, we consider say two different events, E1, E2, and for that. Uh, we find out probability of A. This expression is already discussed. So, we can identify probability of A and then similarly probability of B. And then using these two information, we can find out the lower bound. Uh, in this case, lower bound is 4.44 into 10 to the power minus 4 and also the upper bound, uh, which is maximum of these two and that is 3.75 into 10 to the power minus 4. Now, this is between failure mode 1 and 2 and then uh, because uh, row 1, 2 and row 1, 3 are equal. Obviously, in this case, again, the estimation will be same. Then we take the other um, uh, modes. So, for example, first and fourth mode and then for that again, we repeat the same exercise and find out the upper and lower bounds. Then uh, we take the other modes that is second and third mode. Again, for that, uh, upper and lower bounds are identified and then uh, similarly, the process is repeated for other uh, failure modes. Then finally, for the overall uh, narrow bounds for the complete system, then we use this expression proposed by Date Lipson. And then using that, uh, we can find out the lower bound. And then for the upper bound also, we can uh, use the same expression where all the uh, different failure modes identified and their uh, correlation coefficients are estimated and based on that actually the bounds, global bounds are identified. So, effectively ultimately what we get is the global probability of failure will remain between these two 
uh, upper and lower bounds. So that's how this different bounds work and we can uh, use the component level reliability or probability of failure and based on that information then we can uh, use the series parallel or mixed system approach to find out the probability of failure at the global level uh, if the uh, component level performance uh, they are independent and if they are not we can also find out the correlation coefficient and for that again uh, we can also estimate the narrow bounds for the probability of failure. So that's how we can convert the element level reliability to the global level for a actual structure. With that our discussion ends here. Thank you very much.